We'll go back to the board room. Just want to remind everybody to vote on November 5th. If you haven't noticed, we're running a bond. <laughs> uh, so if you would like to each take one home, um, we're going to be putting these up next week because you'll see them all over the place. And um, yeah, just encouraging people to vote and to go to the back of their ballot because <laughs> Proposition 1 is on the oh. back, on the bottom of the ballot. So make sure you Oops. fill out your entire ballot or at least on the back, on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm not picky. I just don't do that. Okay. All right, let's get started. Um, you're going to see uh, some familiar faces at the table, and other people around the room might uh, trip in a little bit because we're going to take a look at how we're doing as a district. We do this every year. Um, we just want to make sure that you know how things are going in terms of our strategic plan. Uh, so this is just a quick progress update for you. It's it's basically just to give you a basic understanding of where we're at with the process. Give you some information on how um, how we're doing with our goals, the five aspiration goals, and then talk about some considerations, the next steps, things we're seeing. Um, but what this study session is not about is going in depth or in real detail about um, one of the goals because that's what the other study sessions are for. Um, and that's uh, that's what we're going to look at tonight. We always start with our promise. Um, wherever we are, wherever we go, and wherever we talk about, um, because this is truly why we do what we do. Um, all kids, no value support, and the incredible staff that surrounds them, teachers, support staff, uh, it's all about getting kids to ring that bell at graduation, and then go on to do something incredible with their lives, um, and the people in these pictures, every single one of them help. Uh, from Teresa Washington, our Native American coordinator, Brandon Anderson, Tony Martin, I mean, teachers at Donald Eisman, teachers at Eli, all the staff there. So. Uh, and finally, the elementary, the um, celebration parade, the um, growth parade, mm -hmm. just a fabulous event where all kids are celebrating. So. And that's, that's what we do. And then in our strategic plan, you know that we have basically three rings to the plan. Always um, our core mission is student learning. It, focuses on our promise, we have our portrait of graduate, and then the goals that measure the success toward that, and then the instructional effectiveness, and then the operational effectiveness that we call sort of the great protectors of the district. Um, they make sure that everything around our teachers, our staff, our students is operational, it's working, and that's everything from like air conditioning to heat <laughs> uh, to plumbing and water. And, when we have kids learning in, when we have kids learning in areas where they shouldn't be learning, whether it's a flex area, a hallway, um, they still make things work. And um, if we um, if we can pass a bond, we can provide students with more space to learn and do um, an even better job of what we're currently doing. Good news: uh, we are ranked seventeenth in the state now. That's up from twentieth. Last year, 295 school districts in Washington State were ranked 17th. We're really proud of that. That means we're competing with top tier school districts, Bellevue, Mercer Island, uh, Lake Washington, and then smaller districts, Derringer, um, University Place, Carbonado. Um, but we are ranked 17th. So we are, I want to say we're on the map. Not there's no pun intended, um, but people are looking to the Sumner Bunny Lake School District to find out what we're doing. And uh, again, it's all about it's all because of the people you just saw in those pictures. <laughs> Statewide update. What we want to do is take you on a little journey um, that funnels you down to our district because I think it's important for you to see how the state is doing. We want to talk to you about a few little updates and changes um, that the state suddenly made. Um, Kelly, you can explain this real quick. Yeah, so um, we had this OSPI statewide webinar, and then there was this kind of news release bulletin, and we didn't have any notice that this was happening. So in the past, um, the state, when we looked at our um, smarter balanced assessment scores and our science scores, we were always looking at a level three or four as what we understood as meeting standards. So that's how we built our strategic plan. That's how our school improvement plans are built. 
you know, at each of our schools. So what happened through OSPI is they sort of um, articulated more meaning behind the score. So what they felt was that the, you know, our community around our state was looking and believing that a level three or four, quote unquote, was passing. And what they, what they kind of redefined it is, is that a level two really means that students are meeting that foundational learning standards for that grade level. And they re kind of like clarify that a level three or four is really meaning that a student is meeting college readiness. So it just kind of redefined what the levels were. So Lori's gonna show you a couple of slides. So when you look at what you, what's up here, on the left-hand side, you can see there's four math bars together that show the four years, four year period of time, and then English language arts. And if you look at those percentages, they obviously look a lot higher than the same bars that you see on the right or on the right hand side. So on the left is all students earning a two, three or four. And again, the state's calling it foundational grade level standards. Mm -hmm. And on the right hand side, now a level three is being defined by the state as being college ready. Mm -hmm. So and again, it just kind of came out and um, Chris Reichdahl had a big explanation around, you know, what is this, you know, what is on, you know, the state test and why they kind of made that determination. So again, it was new for us, no advance warning. Um, it just kind of came out and it was, here it is. So, and then Lori's going to show you another slide in a second. That's gonna, going to look a little bit different too. So it's, how do we now look at this data in a different way, um, interpret it in a different way? So any questions about this before we move on? Because this was new to us. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad it was clarified and because when I, when I saw the student earning three or four, that's what I've been used to seeing. Mm -hmm, right. But then I saw at the top it said meet college readiness, so I assumed that might be the high school scores. Mm -mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So uh, I like uh, this is even less clear probably to the public. Or, uh, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. No, I'm so glad you said that because I didn't understand the difference between the two. And I think you know somewhere else there was foundational college, mm -hmm. college readiness, and there was yeah. a discrepancy, and I wasn't understanding that. So yeah, they're using foundational for the level two. That's a great catch. And the like, what what's interesting too is a slide that Lori will have in here. They change the vernacular a little bit between what you see here versus when you pull up a school on OSPI's report card. So it's sort of it's sort of interesting. So. I was so this, just holding my breath, waiting for you to say which way that was going to fall. Oh, <laughs> we were going to find out that three and four was uh, not. Oh no! I I'm kind of waiting for you to finish. Like, okay, which way did that fall? <laughs> like, we've been doing it wrong. We need to be in five. We're all just there. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, now we're surprise. Yeah. <laughs> well, Glad to you never know. Yeah. Because <laughs> this step, so this was math, and then as Kelly said, this is uh, English language arts. But it did, it really did take us by surprise. I mean, like. Um, Actually, we were texting back and forth during the webinar, like, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, Did you see that? Did you see the yeah, that <laughs> announcement just dropped? Right. So again, the students earning a two, three, or four, and then just students earning a three or four. But what you're going to see in our scores that we report to you tonight, they're only based on a three or four. Mm -hmm. We didn't base them on the two, three, or four. <laughs> and so like our goals and things like that are all based on the three, three or four, four, not mm -hmm. the two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Right. We probably feel better about ourselves, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> if they were two, three, or four, <laughs> but um, we're keeping it with a three or four. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry, here's the end. And and you're going to see. I mean, even statewide, we're struggling in math, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But math is definitely an area of concern for us. Mm -hmm. So here's the report card that Kelly was telling you about. Yeah, if you look at where Lori put the arrow on there, um, if you look over on the left side on that row for assessment, notice they use the word foundational over there. So that foundational is what you were just saying, JB. That's the level two, three, and four. And then when you look on the right side, they don't use the word college readiness. Once you, when you're on OS Private Report Card, you can click in. It's just interesting that they have it on the one page, but they didn't use that same language when you click the button to dive in at that school level. So when you look at it, you really need to know that, you know, on the left, that's a two, three, or four. And then when you're over here on the right, on the consistent grade level knowledge and above, notice that little word, that's just levels threes and four. So that was a little, it's kind of confusing, like why the state didn't keep the same language. And I, we don't have control over how OSPI reports it on there, but that, that's what it is. So there was that, I, I, I wish that the language was the same, but it, they, they just, they didn't do it that way. I was just going to say, I actually prefer the consistent grade level knowledge uh, 
equal to all of the things because it does span the mm -hmm. elementary high school. Yeah, and it's not off putting for those that don't plan to go. That was one of the comments that people made too about using that word college because not all students have that goal to go to college. Is why isn't it like career and college readiness? Or so there has been a little bit. I've heard that. Or just the consistent grade level knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of shocked by these. I'm, I'm really glad you heard it. Let's talk about these changes and put it into perspective. Well, I mean, we have to tell you again, like we just found out about these. I mean, so this is brand new and. Um, you know, and every one of our schools has this report card linked to their website. So we thought it was important for you to see what it looks like when parents do click on the, the school level report card. Because um, not the language isn't consistent and it will probably be unclear for many people. Okay, so that's how the state looks. That's like how the county looks. Um, as a county, uh, we are ranked third in ELA. And we made sure to put an asterisk there that our scores are based on the level three and four, so that you know that that's where we're at. Um, Derringer University Place performed a little bit better than we did, Carbonado, um, but you can see Derringer and Carbonado, well, we get a lot of Derringer kids, and some, a fair, like a few Carbonado, but uh, really proud of that performance, and you can see where the state performed as well at 50.3. So third in ELA and Fifth in math, barely. Barely. I mean, it's a squeak by with point two, but um, so we were ranked fourth last year in in math and ELA. So we went up in ELA and I want to say down. I mean, we're so close. Oh, we're almost the same in in math. But again, Carbonado, Derringer, University Place, top three. All right, Megan. Yeah. So. Carbonado and Derringer are from the K through eight. Right. So that starts, their scores only go to the eighth grade. Ours mm -hmm. takes in all of it. And we've seen enough data that in high school, mm -hmm. sometimes it tails yeah. off until the 11th mm -hmm. grade and pops back up. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, really, Paul, we would be third. Yeah. I like <laughs> and if you want to go back to this, we could be second. <laughs> yeah. I like the way you think. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, well. LA is a little different though. I mean, high school still performed very well at yeah. the LA, but, uh, math. but the math, is, and you, you've explained it that, well, it's mm -hmm. not part of the grades, so they don't do it until all of a sudden, 11th grade, they need to do it. And... Yep. Well, and you can see how the state performed in math as well, based on the level three and four. So again, um, 17th in the state, I mean, we're ranked quite high in the county, especially like higher if you take out the K-8. Um, but again, just really proud of that performance. And we're the biggest district up there. When right. you think about like district our size or... <clears throat> Any questions about that before we move on? So now um, we just want to remind you how this all works in our in our district. We, we take a lot of pride in a tight alignment where we want to make sure that our strategic plan gets to the kid and everything in between is aligned and works together, it's connected, coherent, uh, cohesive, you name it. Um, and whether it's the school improvement plans or whether it's operational goals, we just want to make sure that what we're doing here uh, sticks together, which is why we aren't a school district that all of a sudden just takes on the latest and greatest, um, the shiny penny, right? We we stick with what we think works. And based on our data, um, it's showing that it does work. We call them, we try to stay away from the random act of brilliance, right? <clears throat> now, the following slides, just wanna make sure you know how to read them because I uh, made you this little key. So if you see something in red, a school didn't meet benchmark or we didn't meet a benchmark. Um, and again, those benchmarks are arbitrary. We set those for ourselves. And most of them we set high because we have high, incredibly high expectations for student performance. The green means they met benchmark. If you see a little down arrow that's red, we had a decrease in performance, and obviously the up arrow in green is an increase. So let's take a look at um, goal one, Beth Beckman. Um, third grade. We're looking at ELA. 
What do you notice? The 2223 screen. Mm -hmm. Things I first noticed, but in parentheses, the 2024, mm -hmm. you wrapped up 69 and parentheses 71. Yeah. So you upped your, yeah. your benchmark. Yeah. Which then means that we had more red. Right. <laughs> 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 so I'm so glad you noticed it because we were like, oh, we're at 67.1. 69 is going to be easy. So we increased it to 71.4. And then, <laughs> so we kind of shot ourselves in the foot because if we would have left it at 69, <laughs> we would have benchmarked. But we were like, no, we can, you know, we can do this. Um, and I appreciate that spirit that we want to, I mean, we want to compete, right? against ourselves to get better, but I'm glad you noticed that, Paul, because, yeah, quite a few of our schools um, would have, yeah. You know what else I noticed? Yeah. You color-coded this, both the arrows, you know, up and down, mm -hmm. and it was easy to read graph. Mm -hmm. I didn't really pay that much attention to the red blocks mm -hmm. where it didn't beat the goal because I did notice that, oh, they up. What they wanted to achieve, but I did pay particular attention to the errors, mm -hmm. and and then some of them were just all right. down. Mm -hmm. That didn't really cause me. To see it. But I did notice a couple of them. big changes. Well, Liberty Bridge went from forty-seven to sixty-eight. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard work. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's yeah. tough teaching. And well, I'm going to tell you, even the 75 to 76, you know, when you're at 75, mm -hmm. to get to 76 is, yeah, that's tough. And 80 to 82. Um, anything else you notice about that that you want to comment on? Kelly, David, or two, anything on that? Okay, so next year, our benchmark. <laughs> 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 because we were like, oh, 71.4, that means we have to increase the uh, the 2025 benchmark. Did we get to add two? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so it's like, um, we'll see. But what this shows us, though, is that if we keep yeah, if we really keep striving to reach that 80% in 2026, the data shows us even countywide, statewide, we're still performing well above the, the average so are there any programs in any of the schools that for one reason or another put them in a higher or a lower bracket based on the student population that might be what do you think there well yeah i mean yes there are so sba scores are, I'm, I'm thinking we have this other measurement that we use for sba i mean it's just really how many kids are at that particular building at that grade level i know um sometimes if we have let's say there's a, a school where there's say two third grade teachers or three third grade teachers and you have one teacher who's out with a long-term sub i mean sometimes the quality of the teacher mm -hmm. matters so much that sometimes just you know a long-term sub can impact particular scores at a building. And when they don't have that many students at third grade, their data is so, it's just, it fluctuates so much. You know, at a high school, it's a lot harder. And if you have one 10th grade math teacher, you don't notice that variance as much. So elementary can be really volatile depending on, you know, a teacher in, out, that type of a thing. Um, if a school has a lot of students, I see Karen back there, so you're going to help me, Karen. Um, if a student has a lot, or a school has a lot of students who have an IEP, and um, we can sometimes see, I mean, students have an IEP for a reason, and so if you have a school, larger population, lots of students with an IEP for reading, per se, you're going to notice some lower SBA scores for those students, they have the IEP for the reason. So sometimes that can make a little bit of a difference. Um, and then WA AIM though, that's the alternate test our like lowest cognitive level students would take. That's not incorporated into the SBA scores. That's a different, that it does get incorporated into a different measurement that the state uses for us. So sure, that was a long explanation. No, thank you. <laughs> but JB, like they all have a STEM specialist and they all, we all have basic some of the same basic mm -hmm. components. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Because I didn't know if you asked about like if one school has a 
like if Tali Heights is a special program that another school doesn't. Or... Oh, okay. So like highly capable. So Emerald Hills does have one class of highly capable third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders. So we um, we we disaggregate that data. So we'll take Emerald Hills data. We'll take out the high cap classroom and then look to see what was their SBA scores without high cap. How much did high cap impact them compared to the other classrooms? Okay. But that's the only building that has like a high cap. And the other buildings, I would say, are pretty much the same as far as programming goes. Okay. Yeah. Intervention classes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All the same. Yeah. But six out of the nine elementary has made progress. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is our benchmark. Yeah. So <laughs> But um, a lot of people, there's a lot to be proud of right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been looking, I mean, they're all when you go up daffodils. Mm -hmm. I'm very impressed with because I yep. know the work to reduce. Yep. And those type mm -hmm. of things. But, I mean, they're all great. That one sticks up to me because I know how much work is going on. the names um, there. Oh, I, I just got this last night and I forgot it, but the percentage bilingual is, mm -hmm. it is significant. Yeah. Yeah. That's another. They have a large number. Newcomers come to the United States within the last two years. The students in the ML program typically do not meet standard until they So many, many students there are the highest number of students. Okay. Looks like a look at math, third grade. Benchmark again. I know. <laughs> right? Move that benchmark and gosh dang it. Because, uh, well, when that benchmark in 2023 at 60, when we kind of blew it out of the water at 70, we were like, well, we have, I mean, we can't go backwards. So we thought 74 would be reasonable, but um, yeah, we're struggling in that. And you've seen it, I mean, you've seen the plan, you've seen what we're going to do. We probably can uh, remind you of a few highlights of that, but. Um, mm -hmm. Math is, math is an area where we're concerned. Well, one of the positives is Liberty Ridge went 53 to 65. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on the ELA, third grade, they jumped 20 points as well. So kudos to Liberty Ridge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, last year, one of the action steps at Liberty Ridge is they are a title school. And so in their title school, I think one time per month, they use title funds to sub out teachers. And then they were doing some work together, you know, kind of like a PLC, looking at lessons, looking at data, et cetera. And so then, I mean, you can see the results of that kind of targeted work and they do benefit from extra title funding so they can do those types of things. But that was just one thing they were really, it was every single month throughout the school year that they did that targeted work. So. Well, sure. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But press report, we're a little concerned about uh, dropping 20 points like that. But, um, yeah, those are the things where we'll meet, you know, Beth and I will meet um, with the principal too to figure out like what was happening at that school, what, you know, what happened in third grade there last year, what, you know, did you, you know, what were the extenuating circumstances, you know, did you have a brand new teacher, did you have a teacher out, do you, did you move grade levels of teachers, really talking through like what does that look like and then how do we, you know, make those changes so that we get better results the following year, so you really have to dive in and go what was different about that school year, why did you you know, why, why did you see that swing in numbers like that? And again, they're different cohorts of kids. The kids you see in 22, 23 are not the kids you see in 23, 24. So it's a totally different set of kids. So you have to, you know, kind of take that into consideration as well. Right. So we'll watch those kids now as fourth graders mm -hmm. to see how they perform. Yeah. Um, but Emerald Hills dropped 10 points, which is great. Mm -hmm. That's tough work. I mean, I hope people realize that. Like, it's hard to make, to make games like that, mm -hmm. especially when kids are coming in either skill deficient or... With mental health issues, um, our staff are working hard to I mean, to make these games. So our benchmark um, for the current year is 77. <laughs> uh, we're going to do it. We'll never be accused of being underachievers. <laughs> Maybe over expected. Over -expected. <laughs> okay, so let's look at fifth grade. We raised that benchmark from 71 to uh, 74. And yeah, the numbers sort of speak for themselves. 
I wouldn't say the principals were really surprised on this one. They didn't expect to see a drop like that in fifth grade. And so there was lots of conversations with them around, you know, because people really started this kind of focus in on mathematics a little bit. And so it was sort of strange about people really naming what they thought was happening and they're building around that number. Um, so this has been, this has been, you know, how do you keep your finger on the work that's happening in ELA while at the same time you're trying to increase what's happening in mathematics? Because at elementary, these are the same exact teachers. And so you're putting more on their plate and they're still having to balance those. So this is a, this is a constant conversation with us around how do we, how do, how do we manage that? So, and then these are our, our current sixth grade students. So if I were a middle school principal, I would have been looking at these scores. Mm -hmm really wondering what we needed to do or what we could do to support these students coming in. Yeah, our um, research and assessment director um, has been working in this platform we have called Homeroom. And so what it's able to do right now, so the middle school principal, so what happens is well, you have the elementary scores, but middle school principals want to know who are the kids that are coming to them because they come from multiple elementary schools. So the way that the platform works now is they can see their current sixth graders. It automatically will show them their fifth grade SBA, their fourth grade, their third grade as their cohort. And so it's super slick to kind of see what their progress has been over time. And you're not just looking at who might be my feeder elementary schools, they're your, they're your kids. So that's something um, that's kind of new that principals have been looking at this year as well, which is really cool. So Kelly, as you're looking at, as principals are looking at these, are we looking more of it like longitudinally? Because I know that uh, tests are changed. Mm -hmm. And there are times when we're all surprised when we get the scores because the, the test is mm -hmm. significantly different. So when I look at it, two years is kind of difficult. Do you guys look at more of, the, more of a block than mm -hmm. just a two-year? Yeah, and the SBA test has changed. So if you even go back four years, it's it looks different now. And that's one of the big concerns on math is people are, they, people feel, teachers feel like they've taken the test down to fewer questions so students don't have the opportunity to really show what they know. And so they feel like this, even though they've shrunk the test a little bit, if you don't have multiple opportunities, then it might be deflating scores. And there's questions that are on there that are um, pilot questions that they don't, they just, you know, the state's using them to see how many kids are getting it right. What are they missing, et cetera. So students, I mean, it's, it's hard to even kind of glance to see what students are doing sometimes to know what's counted and what's not counted. but. The change in test has been a, that's been a, like a wondering. Mm -hmm. um, Is it to show demonstration mm -hmm. and start to decrease the amount of opportunities? Yeah. In the past, you've talked to us about start easy questions and then they kind of build to the So that it's, it's taking every student to the maximum of mm -hmm. what they can what they do. Um, with these tests that are doing less questions, are they just kind of hit the kids with the harder questions right up the front instead of letting them kind of warm up and, and yeah. build to that level? One part of the test is um, a computer adaptive test and the other part isn't, but that I, I don't, yeah, so they I, I don't know the exact metrics behind it, but yes, the way the theory kind of works is they'll give a student a question and then if they get it right, it, it does adjust the grade, the, the types of questions that students are getting to figure out whether it is that level two, level three, Type response, but there's there's less than there used to be, so that mm -hmm. that you know your ability to kind of move within it has definitely has changed. So fifth grade math, mathematics. I mean, we might not have met benchmark, but six of our schools mm -hmm. uh, made improvements, and some of them are significant. Like look at Liberty Ridge, mm -hmm. Emerald Hills. Mm -hmm. And Holly Heights only dropping by one is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the eighties is still amazing. it is. Mm -hmm. Lonnie Lake Elementary seems to be drop, dropping on all types too, from high to they went from seventy one to sixty four in the LA, you're right, and then then um, mm -hmm. in the third grade as well. The same when you look at elementary, it's same teachers. Mm -hmm. So like when you look at middle school, like just like, yeah, so you're, yeah, you're thinking like we're thinking it's so what's happening in those classrooms, what do these students need for support, what does the teacher need for support, what's different in our classroom configuration this school year, 
those are like all the conversations that we're having with principals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cohort cohorts make a huge difference too. And it's like taking those same students, what were their fourth grade SBA scores? What were their third grade? Because even though this shows down, it could be that they're up from the previous year. And so that's what doesn't show on this is just one snapshot of data and looking at it by cohort could tell a totally different story. So that's, yeah, it's important that we're looking at all of those things. Well, I, I mean, I just want to give a shout out to Donald Eisman. I know there's still, um, their scores only 62, but that school you have to remember is at 148% capacity. <laughs> I mean, it's a school and a half within one school. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if 62% of them in fifth grade meet standard, mm -hmm. it's probably not what we want, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's not bad. Okay, let's look at uh, Sarah Donald. Sarah, feel free to um, talk about or talk us through these, but uh, we wanted to talk about attendance on the data bar overseas goal too. Um, so you can see where we were and where we are and talk about how we kind of tweaked that a little bit. Absolutely. So um, if you remember back to the, if you look back to the report card page from Bonnie Lake Elementary, um, OSPI uses a percentage of kids who are not, are um, consistent attenders. And so if you remember in previous years, we'd say like 60% of our kids had 90% attendance or better. And it became really confusing to say, what is that percentage? You're you know, describing a percent of a percent. And so we made the, our goal has always been 95% of students will attend school daily. Mm -hmm. And so we made an adjustment to that measure of progress to match that goal. So what you see now, that's, so on any given day in 23, 24, 92% of K-5 kids were in school. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. Which is going to be different than your percent of, consistent attenders. But again, if I get 95% of the kids there, then I am reducing the amount of chronic absenteeism. So it's a much not only a more straightforward way to look at it, it's more actionable. Because I can look and uh, coming up in November, you're going to hear a study session. We're going to go more in depth into this and the attendance work and Sarah and the team will really go in depth. But that's hopefully this is a much more straightforward way to look at and a more actionable way to uh, communicate it. I think um, we thought parents would understand that also. The other one is like, what's the percent of the percent of the percent? <laughs> yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and I remember sitting in this meeting and we're looking and we are looking at it going, what, only 60% of our kids are there? Well, no, 60% of our kids are 90, are there 90% of the time. And so that gets to be a confusing way to look at it. This is much more understandable. Well, it lowers the it lowers the goal. I mean, ideally, the goal would be 100%. Right. That's not realistic, but that should be the goal, not 90%. So if you're trying to set 90% as your goal, it's easier to look at what is it out of 100%. Right. And while I've never been a high school administrator, I would think 87% is not bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bad administrator. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, I know. I used to laugh at senior skip day. And I said, you know, if you want to shock me, just have senior show up day. Yeah. <laughs> you really want to shock me. Just have a day where 100% of the seniors show up, and I'll be super excited. And we're uh, well, on time. Yeah. <laughs> but do you see the, the growth, right? From 20, 22, 23 to 23, 24. And again, even the, that 92% over 91, again, those are, when you, when you're already running, Already running a five minute mile, mm -hmm. making incremental yeah. changes or incremental. Mm -hmm. I appreciate what Sarah and her team are doing with the attendance, all the reminders, the push, like yeah. coming to school. Yeah. The positive, the positive right. for you to be here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Before the other habits, right? right. I mean, yeah. Um, but we know that, I mean, I see it all the time in the newsletter. So thank you for all that work. Um, well, the reasons for having the absenteeism. The list of possible reasons grows as they move from K through five to middle school, high school, because from just being sick to being in high school, you could be, you know, a lot more things that can pull you out of school. I see a 5% increase in middle school. Again, you have more reasons to be absent in middle school as you get older. So 5% is a huge jump. Mm -hmm. And when you take that into consideration, but it's changed every grade, you know. Very true. Very true. 
And then if you look at the second one, um, the students feel safe. Go ahead, David. Yeah, so just a reminder, right, that um, when we talked about 100% of students will feel safe, we are using that one question in the CE data, but we recognize that there's a lot of reasons that people will put down that they're not safe. And some of those reasons have nothing to do with the school itself, mm -hmm. right? They might have to do with their internal context, their family context, their interpersonal context, which is why then we also look at those, do you know an adult um, and does an adult know you? And so that's what we look at. And it's good to see that those haven't changed. Yeah. We like to go up. And just so you know, the CV data is taken uh, by students in fourth grade and above. So that so it does not capture fourth grade. Um, we do have other measures, like when we talk, counselors are talking to students, they will look, talk to students in fourth grade, but the CV data is exclusively for students in fourth grade and above. Goal three, take a look at eighth grade, middle school. That time of life. Mm -hmm. um, so last year we met benchmark. Why not? Let's just let's increase that uh, benchmark from 69.5 to 71.8. But as you can see, did not perform like we wanted to. How long do they usually take to get these scores to sit, start the process of sitting down with these administrators and starting to talk? Is that a one month process, a two month, three month? Usually take you to kind of dig into this. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as the students are in the system taking the test, principals are in there like daily wanting to know what student scores are. So in the tied system, as they get scored, it you start you can see how many students, um, how many tests have been scored. So if you know you have 256 graders or 258 graders, you're watching. It'll be like 50 students are scored. Like they're watching their numbers. Like it's crazy how much they're watching. And then um, it's it's scary. Um, and then it's immediately starting to dissect what that is. Principals will know ahead of time. You know if they if they're struggling, if they've had a teacher PLC, a, a particular teacher classroom where there have been you know potential you know, problems, issues. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, they're just watching it. I mean, this, this is, this is the finale, right. Of what's been happening that school year. So, I mean, it's immediate. Um, they're looking some schools will actually have, um, like their instructional leadership team meeting at the end of the year, analyzing data that's come in already. Um, we're putting together little charts for the schools of what we know at that point in time. We're, we're changing the date, like Kathleen does it every single week. Like this is what the data is on you know, June 2nd. Then she's like, this is the data on June 7th. I know we share this with Lori too. I mean, they're just, they're they're hungry for it to, because what sometimes what they'll end up doing is like they're creating their master schedule. And so it's, how do I need to adjust the master schedule? Am I adjusting teaching assignments? Am I looking at this thinking I need more intervention sections the next school year? So there, it's like, that's the time where you have to be responsive. And I mean, obviously you're coming back in the fall with your teachers and looking at data again, but it's like, it's immediate. They don't share it with me right away. <laughs> because I start pacing, I'm like, you know, uh, it's stressful, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes in and especially when it's not, what you're expecting yeah the middle school principals were pretty um we have a principal retreat um we had that on august 1st and it's pretty we share the data all the principals see all the data so all levels see all of it and um, we had a newer employee to us this school year and kind of made that comment and says you you share everybody's data like that's okay and that's our culture here. Like you see it all, you are with your, the middle school principals are sitting there with the elementary and high school administrators all looking at it. And, you know, it's, it's, we, uh, we all own all the kids. They're all our responsibility. And so it's, we do. And it's, yeah, I like that because I mean, an elementary kid's eventually going to be a middle school kid and a middle school kid's going to be a high school kid. So if you're not all in it together and yep. you think that you just own your little piece then that's not the way Mm -hmm. so, but you're well, JB, you're right. Because if I were a high school principal, oh, yeah, I would be looking at some of those sports going, okay, 
what do we need to do for the incoming freshmen? And I know we do some things prior to this, mm -hmm. like school even starting for kids, but that would concern me. Um, yeah, we build transition worksheets too between um, fifth grade to sixth grade and then eighth to ninth. And so um, the Smarter Balance Assessment data goes into that spreadsheet and it's one metric that we're using to identify students for, um, we have at the ninth grade level an intensified algebra class. It's, it's a two period block that, su that supports students who need that extra help. We have read 180 classes for students who need support in reading. So all that data is being plugged in the second we get it to, like I said, again, just trying to build that master schedule ahead of time. Um, who are the teachers making, you know, we try to tell teachers their assignment before they go away for the summer, all of those kind of things. So as fast as that data comes in, we're acting on it. That was going to be my follow-up question. So thank you for pointing that out. Cause I, I know most people in the room that live this every day or people listening don't. No, we're looking at once a year data here mm -hmm. and what's clean this data. Like, how are you assessing mm -hmm. that on a, you know, okay, you get this data. Okay, we're down in math mm -hmm. in the eighth grade. Okay, now do we go a month out and how do we assess them? So we're constantly assessing mm -hmm. before we get to this test. We expect better results out of this. Yeah, so we have um, what's called universal screeners that we use at elementary. You probably heard us talk about Ames web testing, and those are sort of our predictors, like what students need extra support, how do we get them in their win time, what I need groups. At middle school, we're using map testing, and middle school is a little bit harder because to get kids in intervention, it's a semester long class, and then you're taking away an elective to do it. So the way that elementary operates and the kind of supports we can offer is significantly different than what happens at a middle school or high school because you're on that semester schedule, you're stuck to the, you know, the periods of the day. So there's a few complicating factors that go into what does that look like? And, you know, what's the right curriculum for students and, and all of those. So it's, that's, um, we have a assessment team that's meeting. We started last year, we meet every twice a month and we're working on those kind of systems and structures like right now, like what can we do to improve it? How do we, you know, do we have the right type of diagnostic assessments? We have the right curriculum that aligns with that. So that's, that's work at that group right now. Do you remember the ambition class we saw last year? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so not to be excuses in that, mm -hmm. I'm also looking at a few of these schools, elementary and middle schools. Um, our schools are overfilled significantly mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. corresponding way. Right. Um, yeah. It's not helping with that way. Right. I was wondering okay. that with Mountain View, mm -hmm. because you know, basically it's one of our so overcrowded and yeah, their biggest middle school, it's overcrowded. We need a new middle school mm -hmm. to balance out that population. But I mean, they're not satisfied with 32%. Oh, no. 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 Principal's mortified. Yeah. It, I mean, yes. And it's certainly not, I mean, reflective of who, I mean, of the expectation we have. Mm -hmm. but, um, but you're right, though, that school is overcrowded. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, there's others where I look at the elementary. I'm not as quick with the numbers as possible. <laughs> Turn well, over there. well, so we're, we were at 42 this year. Our benchmark is 70. Yeah, big jump. Yeah, we might need uh, uh, to look at that. But, but we're going to still well, I keep swimming. I, I say I'm glad you didn't cry. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very good look for us. No. <laughs> we're going to give it our best. That's what we always do. That's just to go from 32 to 70 is going to be big. So. But you have to look at cohort data, though. Yes. So what were last year's seventh graders? Their numbers moving up is that what will be next year's. And the 70 is the, it would be the eighth grade total middle school score. I mean, for Mountain View, Mountain View just needs to go about 32. I mean, they need to go back up about 44. You're, you're talking about the entire district. Right. And the other thing that's hard too yeah. is the, these these numbers that you see. You know, principals are looking at cohort students as they move, and they can see gaps closing. Even though the next cohort coming in, they already knew we're struggling, and all of a sudden it's like, well, gosh, we got to reach them even greater. Well, that's the hard thing when you get these different cohorts that cycle in. It's really looking at the cohort as it moves, and are we shrinking the gap with that cohort? Even though I got a different group coming in. And it's going to be even harder to try to reach these goals that keep increasing. But that's the other piece that you don't get to see. But this is a snapshot with new groups coming through every time. So, 
Yeah, you're not asking the same kids to exactly. improve on it. You're asking the new yeah. kids to improve. And you on already it. know what you're probably year. getting, and you're trying to shrink that to, to get them even higher. Yeah. And what doesn't help the district is having experienced this. I'm sure you did. You can have an amazing cohort. So let's say the eighth graders and the seventh graders are really strong. So yeah. the next year that gap looks mm -hmm. like everybody got back sassy and sat back. It's not the case at all. What you'd actually be asking is the, the cohort that struggles, we need to move you to grade levels to get you up to where the classroom was. Yeah. Uh, those kind of struggles that to me, I wish they would report more cohort information because I think that's a better picture yeah. of the school of what's going on. Well, um, we know that when schools are overcrowded, discipline issues can mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that. Um, we changed this slide a little bit for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to explain this real quick. And that to me, yeah. yeah. Yes. According to one of you. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. So disproportionality. Yeah. So um, if you look in the third column over where it says 2024 goal, and there's a number one there. So the goal there, when we think about a number one with no disproportionality means that, let's say I'm Asian, for instance, when I have a one there means that for every one student who would be identified as having, you know, Asian heritage, that for every one student in that group, then one student in the entire population would be suspended. So there's a one-to-one -one ratio. There's no disproportionality. Mm -hmm. So when you look down that second column, and I look at American Indian or Alaska Native, and you see 1.29, what that means is for every one out of the whole group, that 1.29 students identifying with American Indian heritage would be, would be suspended, which means that they're being over-identified for suspension rates. When I look at Asian and you see 0.27, that means for every one out of the entire population, it's only 0.27 or a quarter of a person, right? So I would need to suspend, I mean, it's it's one fourth, <laughs> say that the right way. <laughs> like she's talking I understand so. what you're saying. Yes, okay. <laughs> so in that case, Asian students are, I wanna say like they're being under suspended because they definitely don't want over. to, yeah. but they're, yeah. So you really want, so looking at that baseline number, you really want, so when I, I was looking at 2023, mm -hmm. um, so then if you go to the 2024, when you go to American Indian Alaska Native, all of a sudden you'll see it jump to 2.15. You're like, oh my goodness. Right. Again, the end value of students matters because some of our groups have such small numbers of students. It's like when I've showed you graduation rates before where we've had four students who are in the mm -hmm. um Native Hawaiian or Alaska or Pacific Islander students, you get one student who doesn't graduate, all of a sudden your grad rate 75%. We're like, oh my goodness, it's 75%. Well, there was only four students to start with. And so some of those student groups up there are so small, we're gonna see that number swing. And so if this was a real statistical analysis, we may void out some of these groups because the numbers, they're swinging too much and it's not it's not statistically sound to make that determination. So our biggest groups, when you look at white, multiracial and Hispanic Latino, those are our biggest groups. So those three, like if you were to ask me as a you know mathematician, those are pretty sound, large and valued groups. Mm -hmm. Like you won't see that swing as you will with like our American Indian, um, Asian, black, student and Pacific Island of those populations. So, so really looking for a one-to-one -one ratio, less than one, you're being underrepresented over one, you want you're to be over. Close to one. You want to be close to yeah. one, yeah. That's really the key, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How are we feeling in general about district? The fact that you know these numbers, I feel like you have these numbers in your head. So we don't necessarily mm -hmm. have the numbers of those smaller groups. Like the end values of those. Yes. And yeah. So as you're thinking about it, if you wanted to give an opinion, what would be your opinion on kind of how we're doing? I mean, I, I see a jump from one something to two something and I have automatically alarm bells are going mm -hmm. on because we're disproportionately spending. Well, I think yeah. that Kelly, I think highlighted those that are our largest populations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you look at white, multiracial, and Hispanic, the fact that those are moving closer to one, mm -hmm. right, is a good sign. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So when you see Hispanic Latino going from 1.47 to 
and dropping down to 1.2 and moving closer. Again, that's a larger population. And so the fact that it's moving closer to one is a good indicator of the work that's being done. Mm -hmm. um, not dismissing the twos that you see up there, but as Kelly pointed out, when you have a small end size, like we do in Native American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander and Native American, Alaska Native, um, one or two students can wildly swing the percentage. And so if you have um, one or two students that are having a series of rough days, it can exaggerate what that looks like. So I think what Sarah and the team and Josh and the team do, they, they look at, and I think one of the other things that you'll see um, when we get to the spring, we're looking at discipline and those sorts of things is assistant principals and principals are looking at this on a regular basis. And once a month, they are coming through and they're looking and one of the things they're looking at is their disproportionality. So I would say just overall, the largest end sizes, which the ones that Kelly pointed out, fairly good indicators of where we are in general, um, but we don't dismiss um, the smaller end sizes because we also know that that's mm -hmm. something that we have but to Kevin, what my fault is for us to put the end value in there. I mm -hmm. think so. I think you answered the question mm -hmm. perfectly. I think the way you explained that. I was thinking that too. We could like denote something on there, like what there's some type of symbol that would show that those are very- Or at least what percentage of the population they represent, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Because yeah. one of the things you want, right, is if you represent, you know, if you're 80% of the population, mm -hmm. we'd anticipate that they would be 80% of the discipline, right, if there's no disproportionality. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yeah. And so one of the things that might help and one of the things we've looked at in the past is putting mm -hmm. that rather than just the pure end value mm -hmm. uh, and being that statistical term. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's, yeah, just they put, put it, the, they null put the null and then they, a lot of times you want to see it. So because there's no significance in an end size so small, even though we're trying to articulate mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. there's a notation in there. That is so that you know how low the number is that mm -hmm. can completely uh, skew the the numerical value. So you'll see a lot of just X. Yeah, and yeah. Be in there, but that's what I was going to say. Straight. Yeah, if you were to go to OSPI report card for some groups, you'll see the data is suppressed because the end value is too small, and they don't want students to be able to be identified. Right, so they'll you won't you, they'll put their little you know asterisks on there, and then it is it's it's suppressed. So I think the most important thing I heard you say. Was that principals are looking at this? So that makes us happy. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. They're looking at this on a daily basis because as problems arise, mm -hmm. it means that they're having a bias check, right? By looking at this and saying, "Okay, when I go to administer discipline, I've got this in the back of my mind to make sure am I fairly administering that discipline." Mm -hmm. well, thank you for explaining that, though, because it made a big difference. It makes a big difference. And then this one is the same. It's just mm -hmm. by um, special populations. And so when you're looking at this one, what's important to know when you look at the row that says special education, so those are students who are being served with an IEP, that student can also be multilingual. Mm -hmm. So these rows, the same student could be in the special education row as is in the multilingual row. The student can also be low income. The student can also be homeless. So these are not discrete categories as like you saw on the previous slide. So this could be one student showing up multiple times in this data point. So again, you can see um, kind of the, where we were 2023 and that second column over to where we were in 2024. And again, these populations are going to be much smaller than the total district population. So again, they're more, there could be more swing in here. Um, but I mean, but still That's it's awesome. data that you want to look at. Sorry to interrupt. Has our homeless population increased or decreased? I have to ask mm -hmm. Beth or Josh that question or Melita. Yeah. We have um, we're yeah, good point. We're about 190 right now. There's our account 191. But last year we were up, we were at um, I want to say 297 account And that was up over the previous year by about six. Mm -hmm. So we're down a little bit right now. Well, that's just because it's October. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, this is compared to the whole population. So using that same measurement as you saw on the previous screen. It's um, nice to see a decrease in special education though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then multilingual, really, that's no disproportionality when you have a 0.04. So low income, you know, I'd, I'd want to do a little digging there. And especially homeless, I'd want to do a lot of digging there around what's going on. Well, what's our graduation data tells? 
Who's struggling the most? Well, let's talk about that. Right? Yeah. And these are things yeah. that principals and assistant principals are also looking at, mm -hmm. right? So when they're when Sarah and the team are looking at this, they're disaggregating by all the different measures. So that's one of the things that they're looking at. And in fact, when we do administer discipline, you know, there are things that you know, we check. This is a student uh, served in special education because there's laws and things that come in. So they're looking at that on a daily basis. <clears throat> so the other part of the point is the advanced coursework because we want to see more students taking advanced coursework. And we've exceeded this benchmark. We, <laughs> we met this benchmark uh, already, but we need to figure out what to really do with this whole terms of taking advanced coursework, but um, yeah, we talked about that. We're like, how do we how do we alter the benchmark? Do we make it fifteen percent? Like, what do we do? Right. What does that look like? So, yeah, it's just amazing that our students want to be challenged in different ways. And so, yeah, this was this was pretty exciting to see. And they also want to take more CTE courses, mm -hmm. right? They, I mean, they do. And yeah. if we had more space, mm -hmm. they could. Yeah. Oh, um, oh, you know, goal five. That's our. That's my. Uh, like my heart right there. Um, we are supposed to be at ninety five percent this year. We'll get there. I know we will. I mean, we continue to make steady growth, but this year we down a little bit. Our number might be going up a little bit more. Um, OSPI is extending our window for cleaning up grad data. One of our biggest, or I said to say one of our biggest, but a huge challenge for us is our students who just disappear and we don't know where they go. So it takes so much research to find, you know, students are moving someplace else, but we have to have verification that, so say they move to Texas, we have to have verification that they enrolled in a different school. So we have to get something from that school, et cetera. So even today, Steve Sholand um, tracked down, I want to say there was like three more kids or something that they tracked down who went someplace else. So we have a short window left that we can, re we can, we do these updates into Cedars to, get more graduates so we're we're hoping but that's we've got to track down kids when they move go someplace else we have to have the records and so that family can't just tell us they moved wherever we have to have verification that they enrolled in another school so there's this huge responsibility that we have as a district to where they go what did they do did they really enroll how do we get proof so and then if, if they enrolled do you just not do you not have to count them anymore because they're not your responsibility anymore yeah, they're off yeah they're off for us so when some when a student does that it helps us in two ways it changes our denominator because now we have one less student and then we have one and then they're out of the non-grad rate as well so if a student moves and goes someplace else it's kind of a double positive, positive <laughs> yes rather than if we just get a graduate it's it's a single positive but yeah so it's yeah, we, it's, a good, it's a good positive, but <laughs> but what we really look at is nine point four percent of kids didn't graduate, mm -hmm. and and now what? Yep, because we don't give up on kids. Yeah, and what are they going to do when they you mm -hmm. know when they get done graduation alliance GED? What, I mean, what is it? Open door? I don't know. And some are still with us. So some students, um, I want to say we have close to fifty that are with us right now as like a fifth year senior because they just need more time to get their credit. So even though it's not showing up there in the four year cohort, that's another thing to be proud of that the students are still with us. They're going to get that diploma and that's what matters the most, right? We want that four year to be, you know, a hundred if it can be, but if, if that student is sticking with it and has that staying power, then that's, that's fantastic. So yeah, so there's kind of, there's two different buckets of kids that we're really looking at, right? We need to keep them in the system until they graduate. And then how are we tracking down these mm -hmm. others to make sure they're on some path to, you know. You have a question and then a comment. The question is, when did the um, COVID, you have some uh, waivers you could do uh -oh. credits. When did that end? This is Kelly's favorite topic, Paul. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, well, Paul. <laughs> The last two years, they they kept taking things off each time, and so now they're all gone. So if for the class of 2025, there isn't anything left. So no, there's no waivers for the pathway, no waivers for credit. The only thing left, there's one thing that we can do as a district, and then we can waive two elective credits. It's just it's a local district waiver, and it wasn't associated with COVID at all. So they're all gone now. So the schools are in a little bit of a panic mode. Because there's still this, there's this huge mindset out there still 
with about doing online. Kids are not earning six credits a year when they're doing online. And so that's part of some of the data that you see. Kids will leave us to go to an online school. They come back, they're credit deficient or you know, they're with us in online and they're not earning their six credits. And so it's, so we gotta figure that out. I can't remember what's in your post, but it was that we had a higher number of students coming in in junior and senior year, mm -hmm. completely deficient in credits. Mm -hmm. That's, That's in here on a future on a future slide. Yeah. yeah. It's in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like Paul, we had a student um we have our, we have um, every couple of weeks, we have a meeting with Eli Hill and then the two high schools of admitting students into the program. But we just had a new kid enroll a senior with 4.65 credits, I think it was. And it's like, where, where are these kids coming from? And then this student, the goal is to get them to that 10 credit mark and then they wanna go to Clover Park. So they'll be with us for this short amount of time and then they head off. But it's it's like, what is happening with kids? But we're still, that that's, that's an impact to our graduates right now. That's that's on here because all that it's just still surfacing for us for these for these kids. So mm -hmm. I gotta tell you, we also run a schedule at the high school where there's oh. a wiggle room for kids. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. junior credits is like James too. I mean, so we I don't know if other schedules, master schedules look or you know, provide increased opportunities for students, but like if you're in our if you're in our system six period day. Mm -hmm. You can't fail. Yeah. 24 opportunities in ninth grades, nine through 12, you need 24 credits. A few kids, we have kids who come with some credits from middle school, mm -hmm. but really it's 24 for 24. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then we're ranked against other school districts, right? So you go to Bethel, who's on a five period day, students can earn 30 credits in their four years, and Bethel's grad requirements are 26. So students can fail four full credits and still graduate. Other districts are on a four period you know, whether it's an AB block or however they do it, but those kids can earn 32 credits and then, you know, they might have a 24 credit graduation requirement. They might up it and have 26, but it's like our kids are not playing in the same, you know, not, they're not playing by the same rules as other students. So our six period day is a, is a challenge for students. You can't, you can't mess up a single time or you're not graduating without doing some summer school credit recovery, putting you in an online period during the day. We double you up on classes using some type of credit competency. Like it's like we, we do everything we can to try to make up for. So make if that's something the board's interested in studying, um, we would probably entertain that. Mm -hmm. Just if there was I think that's option. an interesting kind. I went to college it was a course. I had friends that went and it was a semester system. I thrived in the quarter system because mm -hmm. I could be like a pit bull on three classes. Right. Oh, yeah. And I got great grades. Mm -hmm. These, my friends would have four or five classes and string out for six months mm -hmm. or five months. And it was more difficult. I, so mm -hmm. I, with that, I wonder. A problem for, definitely for some of our students that if we had fewer classes and a little more time in those classes. Mm -hmm. it, would it accomplish more? Yeah. I, I was involved when we had the one of the things that you have to consider when you look at those is we want Bang City right here <laughs> with us because the cost is tremendously higher. Oh, mm -hmm. it's, it's just something you would want to yeah, do. No, four period day is an eight period. Oh, day. yeah. Yeah. Class. So your staffing in that is mm -hmm. is much higher, and that's that's why we left it. Honestly, mm -hmm. is it got down to a cost situation. So Kelly, I had a question when when we're looking at these numbers, uh -huh. in, you know, nineties and such. It doesn't take many kids to depress. In other words, the higher you go, it takes less kids to to bring down that percentage who may not make it through. Correct. Your last 10 percentage of parts. Your last 10 percent Because you're getting down to one, you're talking, you're talking 10 kids can affect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the thing where like all the measures we have in place, like we've done all of these things and that's what's increased our grad rate over the year. Mm -hmm. And now you get to this place where you're like, what else do we do? 
how can we help the student? And and we have a we have a spreadsheet that's all the non grads, and it's it's kid name by kid name. And then you go in and you're like, like looking at the aces that this child has, and you're like, what do we do as a school district to overcome those things when there's you know, I mean, you just name the situation that child has been in. It's like, how does the school district, what do you do? Well, and the, so the other thing that, and Kelly mentioned this before too, cohorts, but we don't get to see because some of those kids are staying. So we track that same group, even though we're at 90% and they graduate mm -hmm. and all of a sudden that graduate mm -hmm. is 96 to 97 because yeah. they graduate the following year. Mm -hmm. But we're not looking at that. And that's the other thing that you don't get to see is these kids are staying and then we're tracking them and that percentage, even though it's not on time, but it's going to go way up because out of those 50 kids, 35, 40 graduated. And now we're up into the higher 90s. And then don't forget all of the students who stay past senior year in the DLC or the community based program count against our grad rates. So <laughs> Kathleen will like add in if we've got 15 kids, that's two point whatever percent yeah. on here. And that's not that's not on here. So that's another right. compounding yeah. factor. And up to 22. And up to 22. Up to 22. Yeah. 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 So that's another. So, yes, yeah, so if I can emphasize that a little bit more, right? So, this is not just students in community based. So, just as a reminder, um, students who are served with an IEP have a right to be in school now up to their 22nd birthday. So, we had a change in case law. So, it was up to their 21st birthday. Now, it's up to their 20 or the year they turned 21. Now, it's up to their 22nd birthday. So that's going to include all the kids who go to our community-based transitions, but it all, there is quite a number who continue to stay at the high school in their um, special education service program beyond their fourth year, mm -hmm. right? Because their IEP demands it and they still have IEP goals. And so, um, you know, we went from, was it, I think two years ago, we had about 16 interns or so at CBT. Last year we were at 26 and now we're over 30. And so all of those kids are counting in the non grant Not asking you to do more work or change your graph, but it would be interesting to see another column with those mm -hmm. groups and how much they're mm -hmm. increasing every year yeah. and how that's affecting mm -hmm. your yeah, because we have it on our non grad. It's on our it's on our non grad sheet. We yeah. have the students and we say they're DLC, they're CBT, they're, you know. Maybe yes. Any any kid almost that is continuing their education mm -hmm. would be nice to see that number comparison in some ways if it's an IEP or you know, well, based or somebody who's our fifth yeah. year seniors mm -hmm. or, if they're yeah. continuing. And I was saying maybe that was something that you get stuck in too deep or doesn't have to be in on this Yeah. Yeah, that would be <laughs> really good to see. So so not a suggestion or how, but my question is with all the various programs now we have to help kids graduate, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And now we have a larger group of kids who are not graduating because laws have changed and such and dro kids dropping out of those things. Do we have adequate resources to track all these kids down and to do those things? Because mm -hmm. I'm hearing Steve is out tracking down kids and I know Steve has a lot mm -hmm. more work to do than that. It's, so knowing what we had before all this happened, knowing the staffing now, do we have adequate resources or do we as a board need to help move the, move the needle? I think it's definitely something we should yeah. consider and look at. Yeah. Because if, we're, if our scores are going down because we don't have adequate resources to track all this, then that's something we can <laughs> definitely take a look at. I'm also wondering, and because you you can see what we've noticed after the second year of this strategic plan that you know math is a concern, and it, it, we just talked about the increase in the number of students qualifying for special ed. But I'm also wondering if the board would entertain a proposal from us to um, study further different scheduling options for high school um, benefits. Well, was there until I heard it could cost double. Well, it doesn't well, cost double. double. It cost double. It, 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 they take double the classes, but it doesn't yeah. necessarily cost double. If you go to eight period days, it's it's substantial. Yes, right. Right. but I will tell you, we can't really study anything no. without space. Right. So, um, but I'm just wondering if you would, at some point, entertain a proposal to allow us to study. Well, I think um, it's in general you're talking about 
or 24 for 24, like you don't have any wiggle room to mess up. Mm -hmm. So not not necessarily just specifically study four period day, but just study that in general to say, how do we create, we're gonna stick to that 24 for 24, how do we create space for, for air? Because mm -hmm. there's going to be air. I mean, yes. that's, Kids, yeah. you also have kids that want to take other classes, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, they want to take a yeah. a, C, another CTE class, or they right. fail. It's it's not just well, designed for students that fail, right? Okay. It gives them access, but that gets all kids access. Mm -hmm. If you're a four year band kid, yep. and you and band is your life, and you want to be in band, and you're in Joe Carl's class on a twenty four credit period, you know, six period, you don't have a lot of wiggle room, and so. You know, you're in this band class, and you then you can't go be in band and culinary or band and something else because you really these are four year programs, yes. and so a six period day gets really high constraints in that way as well. I guess we'll save that for more discussion. But any questions for Kevin since he experienced it as a student? Well, we have people in here that experienced it as educators. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some that loved it, some that didn't. There's educators who loved it, some that didn't. I thought we were going to have a mob war when it went away mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, but um, it, at that time it was cost. You know, yeah. that's why, and there were there were a lot of positives to it. And there are some challenges. When there are other, there are all sorts of options. There's all sorts of options. So at some point, if we mm -hmm. if we bring a proposal to you and you would entertain us, like studying for a year or however long it would take, if we have space, mm -hmm. if um, space. you know, maybe you would consider that. So. Well, that in the back of your mind. I think it's a broader study. It's not just about graduation rates. Right. It's about how do we improve our school. And just exactly. It's a study of, of mm -hmm. a holistic view of the whole thing. Right. Not just the graduation. How do we study more improvement everywhere? Mm -hmm. Because sure. point, right? If, if you, you're a student who needs extra time and intervention, right, on a six period mm -hmm. day, there's very, like when you go to middle school, it's, it's limited. And the only way you get there is by taking away elective. And so, Hey, I want to help you with math. And by the way, you don't get it. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. That's hard. Well, and as we expand these CT programs and every everybody I talk to in the community where I talk about, we want to have aerospace, we have aerospace certification, we have all these certifications. You really see people's eyes light up because mm -hmm. the whole going to college and not going to college, people start to, to see the importance of these, these CTE certifications that we can send people right from high school into the career world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that they don't have the ability to, the time in the schedule to take the classes. That are some of the things that motivate other kids to keep them in school and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. keep them excited and motivated to take some of the. Yeah, well, you could improve their graduation rate if they're taking stuff they actually want to do. Yeah, they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that point you made about the space is really important because if you move off of a six period day to either a four period, five period, a seven period with two plans, whatever, it takes more classrooms to do it. So, yeah. I mean, just thinking right. about the space of our buildings right now, you, you'd have to have more rooms. Okay, let me get back. We can probably talk about this all night, right? Yes. <laughs> this is the exciting part, though, right? And that's uh, the exciting part being a board member is that you can help us really map out the future of this of this entire district. Um, so you know what's next. I mean, we're going to take down more board visits that align with these goal areas so you can see exactly what's happening. Um, so we're going to look at more calendar, and I can give you another copy of that if you want. And, we're just going to keep making sure you understand what's going on in our schools and um you know you'll see the school improvement plans coming pretty soon but uh, <clears throat> we keep working this plan we keep it in front of us we keep student learning it as our focus and uh and little by little we are i mean we are really becoming a, one of the top performing school districts in the state um, we're very proud of that so thanks for your support for that and i'm telling you the people i get to work with every day incredible that's why I'm going to go listen. This is incredible for all of you. But really, they are exceptional people that will work 24 7 if they had to. So, anything from you all? Michelle, bang? Bang. bang. <laughs> Sarah, anything? Okay. I love that picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thanks for the conversation tonight. He's great. He's great. Thanks. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the president. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. All your work you're doing is so pilot. And onward tomorrow, right? Working to the Any board discussion?
Thank you guys for the presentation. Um, you know, to work as you guys do, put together a presentation that shows the depth that I'm sure it wasn't where you, you guys thought it would be. Uh, it was a little sobering for some of the sports, but yet you still showed it. You still talked about it. I appreciate that. I, we've never been a school district, or at least when I first got on, I think we, we kind of sometimes got presentations like everything's great. Uh, over these last nine years, your guys' presentations are not like that. It's, hey, we're doing good stuff. Here's some things we're still working on, and we're going to really dig in and get to the bottom of stuff. And it's hard to show. It's hard to see as the public sometimes. And so, thank you. Just, I, I think, you know, I mean, I'm looking at a lot of these, but what you realize is those numbers are one snapshot, and the complexity behind those numbers. And it's really why I appreciate the, you know, presentation, because you... I have a lot of confidence that you and you're understanding that complexity and you're building solutions for those complexities as best you can. And, um, and that's one of the things that I think is hard because the numbers are the snapshot. They just don't take into consideration what came before and what's happening after. But um, so thank you for explaining a lot of that and for doing the hard work. And you build strengths, it is not. A lot of non ideal stuff on the screen, but talking about it, we should build trust and good and celebrate the wins and work on the stuff we need to work on. Um, yeah, congratulating 17th out of 249 and lots of different dynamics. Not about the presentation, uh, having had some time to think since the last board meeting and that. Uh, mm -hmm. Do some more background stuff. I would be interested in doing the uh, legislative role mm -hmm. for the sport. Mm -hmm. If I can work with Kevin, what he's done so far, <laughs> Lori, and, and all that. I just needed some time to consider what. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you have a new job. And, and yeah, no, I mean, I, we got the. We, we got the top 10 legislative things completed um, as a group. Everybody was able to contribute on that. Um, so that's that's taken care of and turned in. So that's all done. Uh, but yeah, I think okay, you're we'll the touch base with you. Yeah, I think you'd be the perfect person to take yeah. <laughs> I'll just let you know in February is when they, the early part of February is when they have, you probably did it before uh, down in Olympia. So yeah. you, you know what you're getting into. First couple of years I did it. And then by the third year, I'm like, I I'm not taking a weekend. I'm skiing. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of crimps my style. <laughs> the other question I have is, having heard when this when the court case came down, and said, I'd really be interested to know not only how many kids are now in, with us until the 22, but what is what is the cost to the district and what is the state actually pointing up? I think at the end of the year, whatever is the appropriate time, because I think that's one of the discussions that we should be pushing around the state is it's great. I mean, unfunded mandates are wonderful, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm really curious. We currently have 44 super seniors. Super seniors. And then 44. what would you guess, Karen, just as a wild guess, what that additional cost is going to be to the district? Well, we'll have the cost of or the um, just if you just look at staff and you take a look at it, it's getting a teacher at least two hair, usually more. Yeah, DLC and all the other. Well, if that would be a ton of work, I would be really interested at the end of this year. When, like I said, the appropriate time to take a look at that. Well, at least like 1.2. I don't. I'll be upfront. I, I have concerns the state has not found funding to make sure that's not a bigger problem. District. Oh, yeah. It is probably. They have to it. It's, yeah, it's hit and miss, right? So they find money for one year and get more, and the next year it's gone. Yeah. 
Sign. Back, bottom back. <laughs> you want the other sign up?